So I'm going to mention sequencing in passing, but I'll mostly emphasize what uh, comes after sequencing, what we can do with all the sequences that uh, we are obtaining that we've uh, heard about so beautifully in the past uh, talks yesterday and today. And I really want to begin by thanking uh, the organizers, Eddie, Dan, and so on, so on for putting together this uh, user meeting and having me here as a, as a speaker. It's, it's really a lot of fun and very interesting what we've been hearing, especially the policy side, which is, seems a lot more complicated than assembling 100 gigabases of uh, raw sequence. All right, so I want to begin by acknowledging the people responsible for the work. Um, is broadly speaking a genotype group in, uh, in my lab. I want to especially mention Stefan Osofsky, graduate student who developed the Shore short read pipeline. Um, he uh, went directly from being a graduate student to a group leader at the uh, CRG in Barcelona. And then I want to mention Marco Tedesco, another graduate student who is responsible for the ACD6 work uh, I'll uh, talk about. And we have quite a few collaborators, and you'll see a few familiar names here from uh, JGI and Hudson Alpha, Igor and uh, Jeremy. And uh, of course, any graduate students who are here and are looking for new challenges, we'd like to add your name perhaps on this list. So the reason um, that I get up in the morning is uh, because of this uh, rather simple phenomenon here evolution, which is common descent with modification, and I'd like to explain that with these automobiles. So this is the first automobile that was ever built, contrary to what uh, President Obama said a year ago. It wasn't built in Detroit. It was built not very far from Tübingen in Stuttgart. <laughs> and uh, this vehicle then diversified very quickly within a few years, decades. And uh, already shortly after, we had these different forms here. And you see that there's general similarity to the Ur form, but there are also quite a few differences. And some of these differences are apparently adaptive. So the fire truck is carrying a ladder. That makes kind of sense if you want to fight fires. Other things, it's a little bit less clear whether or not they are adaptive. So the fire truck is uh, red. Is, is that necessary to fight fires to be red compared to the green for the police car? And then other changes are interesting in a different way. So both of these automobiles have four wheels. But when you look at them, you can't easily exchange the tires anymore. And it's unclear whether this incompatibility is something that was selected for because the truck needs to have different types of tires than the police car, or whether this is just inadvertently because there wasn't any selective pressure to make sure that tires are still interchangeable. So what I'm getting at are really these three questions here. What we'd like to know, how and how frequently do new variants arise? Why do some variants increase in frequency? And the corollary would be that others decline in frequency. And uh, why are some combinations of new variants incompatible? And these are, of course, the three core questions in evolution. Uh, mutation or three uh, core processes, mutation, selection, and speciation. And I'll uh, have three vignettes to touch on each of these. So I'll tell you a little bit about whole genome sequencing to understand mutation. I then tell you a major, about a major fitness trade-off that we've discovered between growth and immunity that speaks to selection. And I'll end up uh, telling you a little bit about a common mechanism for a hybrid phenomenon, hybrid necrosis, that's kind of the opposite of heterosis, which we heard about yesterday, and which perhaps has some bearing on speciation. The organism we work with is uh, Arvidopsis steliana, occurs throughout the northern hemisphere, had its origin probably somewhere around here, spread throughout the rest of Eurasia, and then was introduced uh, probably in historic times only, so for example, North America. Uh, reference genome was already produced in 2000. It's uh, one of the best, if not the best, eukaryotic uh, reference genome, at least for, for those with larger genomes. Um, has quite a wide distribution, as you can see here. So for example, there are strains that live in North Africa, others in uh, north of Sweden. 
And it's an inbreeder, and therefore natural strains are typically, but not always, uh, homozygous, which makes, of course, genetic analyses and also sequencing a lot easier. And in fact, makes sequencing easy enough that uh, at the beginning of 2008, uh, we initiated a 1001 genomes project for the species, uh, very much uh, in the same uh, vein as the 1000 genomes for uh, uh, humans. Uh, I'll be happy to note that uh, in contrast to the human project where there actually aren't any uh, complete genome sequences released yet when you go to their website, we already have over 100 complete genome sequences. Most of these so far have been produced at, uh, uh, in my lab in, in Tübingen, but we have commitments for the rest to be filled in from principally from these individuals here, and we're hopefully going to be able to uh, add this up to 1001 at the end of the year. And uh, of course, there's a little bit of one upmanship in having 1001 genomes, but there's also some serious science behind this that uh, we're sampling different regions where our doctors come from, from the native range, sample different populations within these regions, and then different individuals, and that adds up to 1001. So this is really all I want to say about what we've done there, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you afterwards about what we're learning from these uh, genome sequences. Of course, when we compare existing genomes and we see differences, we're looking at the joint effects of mutation and selection. So to understand these differences is actually very important to know what the initial mutation rate is. And now with this new sequencing technology, uh, you can directly measure this. And we recently um, published this. We measured the mutation rate in spectrum Arabdopsis cyana. It works out to one new mutation per haploid genome per um, generation. That doesn't sound perhaps like a whole lot, but what it means is that you only need 100 million individuals to probe every base in the genome in every generation. And for a plant that produces thousands of seeds per individual, 100 million um, uh, seedlings is not a whole lot. What we also discovered is, and I, I should mention here, you, you, some of you might have seen the recent paper on mutation uh, rate in, in humans. So in contrast to the human effort, um, where they had actually a false negative rate of 0.7, so it says in the paper, we estimate that our false negative rate was uh, uh, less than a few percent. One major uh, discovery was also that the mutation spectrum is very uneven. You can see that uh, this change here accounts for about half of all mutations. And one major reason is, of course, spontaneous deamination of macerated cytosines, although, of course, we think there are also other uh, things that contribute to this. And then on the other end, if we want to understand the polymorphisms within a species, um, this is really being informed by comparing a sequence of one species with the sequence of close relatives. And we were very fortunate that in 2005, the uh, um, community sequencing program of JGI uh, agreed to, to sequence two close relatives of Arabidopsis cyana, Arabidopsis lyrata, and, and Capsella rubella. And one major motivation was there not only to see um, the, the small scale differences, but also to investigate how come that Arabidopsis cyana has a genome that's about a third smaller than that of Arabidopsis lyrata. And again, I won't have time to go into this um, today, but really the question that, that we've been addressing there, how can you lose a third of your genome 10 million years and live to tell the tale? And it turned out that this is really very interesting, that basically every feature of the genome that we look at is smaller in Arabidopsis cyana, be it intergenic sequence, number of TEs, uh, uh, number of genes within a uh, gene family, and so on. It really looks like that there have this per pervasive selection for cyana having a smaller genome. And uh, so, so this is then the family that Arabidopsis cyana comes from, the Brassicaceae. It's only um, a tenth of the uh, size of, of the composite, but still a pretty impressive family with about 3,000 um, species here, cyana, lyrata, and capsella rubella. And now there are additional sequences being added in. Here, for example, Bukhara, which we heard about from Tom this morning. So that we're starting to get even sampling throughout the family and hopefully a lot more. And uh, the moniker that we have coined for, for this effort is the Brassica Map Alignment Project. Uh, Rod Wing is playing an important role here. This is uh, uh, 
uh, a parallel in his effort in Ariser. In RISE, we've already held two workshops at HAG earlier this year and just three days ago at the Max Planck Institute in, in Tübingen. And we'll have another one at the Aerodopsis Conference in Yokohama very soon. And here, some of the organizations that are funding this effort, and of course, JGI playing a very big role here. And we're extremely thankful for this. Chris, this is a, a little bit of an embarrassment in, in, in plans, although we were one of the first to have a beautiful <coughs> reference genome sequence for one species, Cyana. We have been very slow in getting additional sequences of closely related species, which have, for example, been extremely informative in annotating, say, the Drosophila melanogaster genome, or also very informative learning about the uh, human genome. All right, so, so why are we doing all this uh, sequencing? Well, one reason is, of course, to, to get at genes that matter in nature, as we heard about again from Tom this morning. And there are different ways that we get it at this. So we're using forward genetics, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But of course, we're also trying to use genome-wide association mapping, very similar to what is being done in humans. And, and just to remind you what the general idea is, how genome-wide association mapping works, you have uh, population of, of plants, some are tall, some are short, and they are secret, there are differences in their genome. So these plants here have only a, a single chromosome with quite only a, a few differences. And then the argument is that in the entire species, there are old mutations that are shared by many members within that species that are responsible for many of the phenotypic differences. So if you go along a chromosome, you can ask at every physician where, for, uh, uh, whether, for example, those that have the blue allele are taller than the ones that have the um, yellow allele. And uh, since I drew this, of course, there is such a position in the genome. So here, everybody's yellow is tall, everybody's blue allele is, is short. And of course, this is an idealized case. There are many problems in doing this one. Uh, there's a very high number of statistical tests you're doing, but also population structure can often uh, um, uh, throw a major monkey wrench in, in this business. Nevertheless, um, we, we spent quite a, uh, quite a bit of um, effort trying to see whether this uh, works. And one trait that uh, we come across that struck us as, as somewhat interesting is size of uh, um, plants. And something that my student Marco Tedesco noticed a couple of years ago, that there was quite a bit of not only was there quite a bit of variation in size between different strains of Arabidopsis cyanus shown here from different places, but what he also noticed was this really strange effect that the strains that are small, that they often suffered from late onset necrosis, that the leaves, un, un, after they had stopped growing, they became yellow and there was uh, um, cell deaths. And uh, there was very good correlation between biomass and this necrosis. And they are not small because of the necrosis. The necrosis happens after, again, after it has stopped growing. So we used that as one of the uh, phenotype among uh, 107 phenotypes total to test whether genome-wide association mapping would work. So these are the five chromosomes of Arabidopsis cyanar. Um, this is the outcome of 260,000 statistical tests. Uh, based on the HapMap that we uh, published a few years ago, which, by the way, was only the second HapMap developed for any organism, namely for Arabidopsis, right after, after humans. So there are all these statistical tests, and the p-values are really quite uh, ridiculous because you're doing so many tests and because there are some other issues. So here we just look for those tests with the very lowest p-values, and you see that um, out of uh, 12 SNPs throughout the entire genome with p-values smaller than 10 to the minus 8. Nine of them are in this very small region, including all the ones that have by far the lowest p-value. And so this group of SNPs identifies a gene called um, ACD6. Now, if you work with humans, um, this is where it becomes really quite difficult because showing that an allele has a functional effect is difficult in, in humans. You can't just take a human with one allele and knock out the gene, and then take a human has another allele and, and knock out the gene. That's normally frowned upon. And, and plants are, are, are a little bit easier there. So this allele that causes necrosis is found, for example, in this strain here called ESP-1 from Estonia. 
And this is the ESP-1 wild type strain. You see it has this extensive necrosis. It's uh, also not all that big. We are measuring here the dry weight of individual leaf. And when we now knock down ACD6 in this strain, you can see that biomass is tremendously increased and also necrosis um, disappears. And I, uh, just for sake of simplicity, don't, I'm not showing you what happens in the reference strain, which has a, an alternative ACD6 allele, the standard allele, if you will, but there essentially it doesn't make a difference whether or not ACD6 is on or off. So the normal ACD6 allele does not make plants smaller and doesn't cause necrosis. Now, this is a huge effect on, on biomass, and uh, I will see to, to Tom that we haven't looked at this in, in the wild, what the effect is, is on biomass. But it seems really odd that plants would accept to have an allele that makes them so much smaller. So why does, uh, is such an allele around? And it's not, um, it, it's not a rare allele. Association for this reason you comment. Actually, about 20% of wild strains have this allele, and we've shown in most of them by F2 segregation, by knocking it down and so on, that it does the same thing. And you find it both in 20% of all strains globally throughout the world, as well as locally in individual places. So why do 20% of, of strains have such an allele that obviously makes them much smaller? Well, necrosis is well known to plant biologists as being associated with infection. It's a typical response to infection. Um, it's, it's, it's not a simple relationship. It's not the case that when a plant is infected by a pathogen that it automatically becomes necro necrotic. And it's also not true that when you're necrotic, you're more resistant, but there is some correlation between the two. Here, tomato leaf and typical uh, uh, necrosis as, as a response to, to infection shown. So obvious question then is, Perhaps these plants accept having this special allele that makes them a lot smaller because it provides protection against pathogens. This is a little bit of eye candy here as an SEM of an Arabidopsis leaf with a, a fungus grown on it. And this is actually an authentic uh, uh, pathogen of Arabidopsis cyana. Most of the work being done on, on pathogen response in Arabidopsis cyana, um, there were, this allele made a difference in terms of infection by this pathogen called Golovinomyces orontia. Orontia, again, it's, it's, it's a fungus. You see that EST-1, which has a special ACD6 allele, is essentially completely immune to infection by the fungus. If we knock down the ACD6 gene, these are just two different transgenic lines. You see that they now become susceptible to the fungus. And here's just the control. Here's our reference line, which is even more susceptible. So this just means that there are other genetic factors that con contribute to immunity, which is not very surprising. What was surprising, however, that uh, um, this uh, special allele not only provides protection against Golovinomyces orontii, as well as against uh, another Golovinomyces species, but it also protects against an oomycete, so that's something completely different eukaryotic yeast from a fungus, Halpernospora albidopsidus. It provides protection against the bacterium Pseudomonas syringae, even provides protection against an insect, against aphids. So there's a gene that provides broad spectrum resistant against a variety of pathogens. So now all of a sudden it doesn't look so odd anymore that uh, these plants accept being smaller. So it's kind of this, this little shrimp as uh, heavily armed, it defends itself uh, very well. That's uh, one strategy to get around and, and perhaps then it's okay if you don't have uh, as many seeds and, and progeny and so on. And then the others, they uh, live uh, life loose and fast. They, they risk it, but uh, uh, they might really get clobbered by pathogens. So coming back to my automobiles here, uh, two uh, uh, fine examples of the German, the German engineering. Uh, uh, this guy here does very well on the Autobahn, but of course will be hopelessly outmatched uh, in the field. Okay, so necrosis provides then a, a, a more or less elegant segue into the last few slides I wanna present. We have alleles within a species that are extremely um, different. And sometimes we find allele in, in Aridopsis cyana strains that look like they come actually from another species that are more related to allele from Lyrata or even something completely different. Um, so the question then arises whether having such very divergent alleles within a species gene pool might cause problems in hybrids. And again, that's really the opposite of what we heard about yesterday, the heterosis.
And so there's this uh, phenomenon called hybrid necrosis that uh, has been described hundreds of times by both breeders and naturalists. And by the way, one reason why this has been described by naturalists so often that uh, plant biologists, in order to establish what were species, they would just do crosses. And it's something that you can do much more easily, obviously, in plants than you can do in animals because plants don't run away so fast. Um, and it's also found in crops, it's found in wild species, it's found in, in, in selfish, it's found in outcrossing plants. So it's really very, very common, a very common phenomenon. And actually, what, what, what we thought was remarkable, there were these hundreds of papers, and we were actually the first ones to write a review on this, so kind of the opposite to what happens these days. There are some, something new is being discovered, and then there are hundreds of reviews being written about this. Now, that hybrids don't do well, um, that is well known to everybody here, and uh, presents somewhat of a conundrum, really. Um, the lay person might immediately react, hearing about, you know, hybrids don't do well, and saying this makes sense because you have to maintain species boundaries, and that's why hybrids don't do well. But once you think about it, this can't really be the case because genes that kill an organism, genes that sterilize an organism, they cannot be selected for. It um, doesn't work. They, they, get, they get lost. So, and, and we are not the first ones who've been bothered by this. Uh, others had been bothered by this uh, a while ago. And Dobshansky and Muller are generally credited for having figured this out, although it recently turned out that Bateson already had figured this out about 30 years um, earlier. And, uh, and these genes are free to evolve independently. So small a, small b here becomes large a, small b. Small a, small b here becomes small a, large b. And these changes could either be by chance or could be due to positive selection. Now we know that small a and, uh, a and b work together, but there's no way of knowing what happens when you put together large a and large b. And it might be, as in the source, that bad things happen. And uh, again, these incompatibilities are normally invoked when you try to uh, uh, um, explain speciation and uh, fitness defects in, in F1 hybrids. And actually, one hybrid necrosis case is, is explicitly discussed by Coyne and Orr in this wonderful book they published a few years ago, Speciation. So we discovered a few years ago, and we as uh, really my uh, uh, graduate student, Jana Lempe, the first case of hybrid necrosis in Aerodopsis um, thayana, and we wanted to develop thayana as a, a as a model for studying hybrid necrosis. And the first question was, of course, is this relevant? Does, hybrid, does Aerodopsis thayana cross in the wild? So we went to the wild and, and, and looked, and uh, we were really quite happy to find that Aerodopsis thayana, although it's largely selfing, it outcrosses at quite appreciably rates, and here's one of our nicest cases. So this is a, a transect. <coughs> Yeah, near Tübingen, you see one yellow genotype on the A1 side, you have a blue genotype on the other side, there are a few yellow tuberists over here, but then you see here at the border, there are two F1 hybrids that we found three years ago. So they are naturally occurring hybrids, so what I'll tell you about might have relevance in, in the wild. So as I mentioned, Jan Lempe had discovered the first case of hybrid necrosis quite by accident, and then when Kirsten Bromley's uh, joined the lab, she asked, are there actually more cases of hybrid necrosis and, and would Zayana serve as a model for studying this? And she, she realized that it's quite uh, frequent, about 2% of all random F1s you generate between different strains show these uh, hybrid deficits. So here are uh, always the parents and you see in some cases the uh, F1 progeny is, is very badly off. Now the, the morpholo morphologically they look quite different, but when you look at gene expression profile you see that they are very similar. So uh, uh, um, these are genes that are induced in F1s compared to um, the, the parents. And the only GO categories that are overrepresented uh, among these genes were those that uh, related to immune response. And uh, our interpretation is that these are paranoid plants. They think they're being attacked by pathogens, even though it's just another plant genome coming in. So in other words, um, something in one plant genome consider something that comes from the other genome as being pathogen derived, even though it's just another plant. So we proceeded to clone the genes. In most of these cases, we have, on, have two genes that are involved. The first gene we cloned is, is this one here. This is the reference sequence. 
Uh, right here in the middle are two genes that loosely speaking encode the pathogen detectors of plants. These genomic regions look very different in the two parents that are involved in this uh, uh, hybrid incompatibility. I should mention that these pathogen detectors, they are the most, uh, uh, they are the uh, most variable genes in plant genomes uh, as published a few years ago. And, uh, and uh, indeed, we showed by transgenesis that this uh, pathogen detector is responsible for this uh, hybrid deficit. Now, initially, we had done random crosses. These were some of the random crosses that showed uh, um, this hybrid necrosis. Wanted to ask whether they are independent or not, so we uh, uh, performed a complete dialogue. You see that there was only one additional cross that, uh, uh, that suffered, so you can quickly figure out that there must be at least four different systems at uh, work. And we are now cloning all of these genes, making pretty good headway. So I told you about this first cross here. We have a pathogen detector here of the NBLR class. Turns out that the interacting gene actually also encodes a protein that detects pathogens. So this has very interesting mechanistic implications. In this uh, case here, it's a little bit more complicated. We have an interaction between two loci here, plus we have a hybrid uh, disadvantage locus here, so that's again kind of the opposite of heterosis. This is the same locus, but a different allele, so that's really interesting. Here we have the same uh, um, interaction as in this cross here, and this turns out to be alleles of ACD6, the gene I told you about earlier, but different types of, uh, of alleles. Here is a different type of pathogen detector of the RPW8 class, and then we've also been looking at two crosses that uh, um, have other defects, and there we do not have immune genes involved, so that's really quite satisfactory. And one way why this now gets a lot faster, and I'm almost done here, is of course we can now um, map and discover uh, variant uh, alleles in one step as we published last year. So here we have a mutant that's purple. We cross that to a wild type plant that's uh, green. The F1 looks normal. We have recombination in the F1, go to the F2. We select all the mutant plants. We're going to have a mixture of our green and purple chromosomes uh, um, throughout the genome. And then only where the cause of mutation is, we expect to have an excess of reads that come from the mutant parent. And this works extremely well. So um, we, we ex make one DNA extraction from a large number of plants here and sequence that. Uh, on, on the Illumina platform, you see throughout the genome, we mostly have uh, equal representation of both alleles, and then there's this, just this one genome where all of a sudden there's a uh, significant deviation, and uh, this defines a very small region in the genome. Um, very close to our point estimate, we find an EMS typical strain, and then we sequence more alleles, and we see this is indeed uh, the right uh, gene. So we can do mutant identification in 10 instead of hundreds of days, and we now have actually shown that this also works for natural variants. All right, I, I skipped these two slides, which just made the point that uh, this hybrid necrosis, pro we think, can tell us something about speciation. So just to summarize, Cyana is an ideal substrate for second generation sequencing, and this is for the enhanced for genome sequences of close relatives. We have a haplotype map of uh, this uh, organism now, one SNP every 500 base pairs. So this will be available later this year, thanks to efforts particularly by Justin Borowitz, Joy Bergelson, and Magnus Nordborg. I showed you that genome-wide association can work, and then I finished by telling you about this numerous hybrid incompatibilities. Or there is a common mechanism for most autoimmunity and causal loci do not appear to be random. And again, this is the beautiful city of, of, of Tübingen. I encourage you to come and visit us and, and see what we're doing. Thank you.